Hi there, my name is Matthew Carson with the Open Source Energy Network. We're very excited to be bringing these testimonies before you today, but first of all we'd like to thank the Disclosure Project. The Disclosure Project has spent a couple years and over a quarter million dollars acquiring these exceptional energy testimonies from trailblazers in the clean, free, renewable energy field. These testimonies are testimonies. They aren't simply interviews. They have been documented with affidavits and documented credentials. These people have important things to say about the current state of energy as it is in the world today. Please listen carefully, watch carefully, share these videos, disperse them amongst your friends, email the links around, but make sure to donate directly to the Disclosure Project today and keep in mind that these are not fictional interviews or showbiz articles. These are testimonies that we hope and the Disclosure Project hopes will eventually stand in a court of law. Thank you. My name is uh, Tom Bearden, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, retired. Uh, spent 20 years, a little more than that, in the active military, mostly in air defense, various other assignments, field artillery, uh, you know, technical intelligence assignment, uh, uh, liaison to uh, Canada to some uh, technical work going on site in uh, turbulent wakes and reentry systems and so forth at uh, the Canadian Armament Research and Development Establishment, and spent quite a number of tours in uh, in uh, basically R and D work in the military, developing missile systems and things like that. For about uh, 20 years or more, some associates and I have been researching very heavily into trying to extract electromagnetic energy from the vacuum. Now, we did so under somewhat duress because the conventional electrodynamics model does not allow this to happen. In other words, it doesn't allow you to extract excess energy from the vacuum and use that to power your load. So it doesn't allow you to make a self-powering system. So we took the approach that some of the phenomenology we had seen in experiments and so forth convinced us that it was possible and uh, there didn't seem to be any real physical reason why it couldn't be extracted if we could find a way to do it. But we had the problem of why doesn't the electrodynamics allow it to be done? So at the same time we also began a study of the foundations of electronics. In other words, what are the fundamental concepts that are assumed in the theory. Where did they come from? And how did they get in there? And that was turned out to be very interesting and uh, very pertinent because electrodynamics kept getting modified uh, and restricted is what kept happening to it. The original uh, theory that Maxwell had was 20 equations and 20 unknowns, quaternion type equations. What we've done is the closed current loop circuit where all the carriers have the same mass per charge ratio. All the buckets have the same weight, so to speak. Anytime you build a circuit like that, it's quite easy to show that the amount of energy that circuit collects when we do this free regaging and we do increase its energy, ever how much it collects, it will then use precisely 50% of that to destroy the thing that let it do that. And it's really the dipole, the source dipole. It will use that to kill itself, so to speak, and have no more excess energy. The other half will go out to the circuit and power the loads and losses. That means less than half gets to the load. Well, to restore that source dipole, in other words, so we can get some more energy in to use, it costs just as much to restore it as was used to destroy it. So we've got to put in more than we can ever get out in the load with such a squirrely circuit. And that's the only kind of circuit we've used in power systems since day one. We're still building them. We're still making power systems that deliberately kill them. So we pay the power company to have a giant wrestling match inside its generator and lose. That's really what we pay them for. So that doesn't seem to be the way to run a railroad. It would seem to be much more ideal to freely change the energy of the system pay a little switching cost so we get it switched over to the load and dump it in the load and let it go, let it power the load. And so you can do it. 
So the problem we ran into was that the electrodynamics had actually been modified to throw out the very kind of systems that we had seen in our experiments, evidence that could be done, but violates the ordinary electrodynamics. And we can do it and not violate conservation of energy. We can do it in accord with thermodynamics, and we can do it in accord with physics and electromagnetics. Now, this is absolutely rigorous. I don't care how many folks want to check that. It will hold up. It is rigorous. So this was one thing we established from the study of the foundations of electromagnetics. You are permitted to have electromagnetic systems that power themselves and their load, and uh, you don't have to put in the energy. They take it from the vacuum, the active vacuum. Our engineers are taught to throw away about 10 trillion times for a typical average case as much energy as they pull out of the vacuum without even knowing it in a generator and a battery. And it's pouring out down the circuit and misses the circuit. They throw all that away and only calculate the little bit that we catch in that circuit and then use. Now, when we measure the circuit, we obviously measure the energy being dissipated by the various pieces of that circuit. Well, if the energy is being thrown out of there, it had to get in there. So obviously the measurements of the circuit will match Poynting's theory because it'll match the energy that actually went in there to get dissipated. Like the country boy said, you've got a pipe here, so to speak, and it's got some holes in it. If you measure all the water flowing out, that's how much water come in it. Now your whole river can be around it and missing the pipe, and you won't measure that. So we have built a whole science based on throwing away this enormous energy that is pulled out of the vacuum by every little old separation of charges, every dipole. Well, in the 50s, in the 1950s, particle physicists discovered, Wu and others, discovered broken symmetry. They discovered how fundamental a process something like this dipole is, where we separate two, two opposite kinds of charges. And T.D. Lee, for example, looked at it for physical charges and so forth, and Lee won a Nobel Prize for it. Any dipole is a broken symmetry in the furious exchange with the vacuum. It's a broken three-dimensional symmetry. What does this mean? Cutting through all the words and getting down to country boy language. It means that <clears throat> nature does not insist on conserving energy in three dimensions. We do because we have a three-dimensional mind. We like to think in terms of space because observation itself destroys time and what we look at is spatial. So we like to think the world is made of space, not space-time. However, nature loves to work in four dimensions. Her fundamental law is conservation of energy must apply in four dimensions. Now, you're not going to beat that one, so never think about that. But there is no law of nature that requires you to come in and say, also, it must apply simultaneously in three dimensions. If we build some gadget, that makes it apply in three dimensions, we apply an extra constraint on what nature will give us. Turning that around, we go around building things that insist on having this three-dimensional exchange of energy. We got to put it in in three dimensions for whatever we get out and lose some in the middle. So we, we're, we got a terrible situation all the way. It's called entropic engineering. We always got entropy beating us to death. Never go over unity, forget it, lose a lot, we talk about, you know, efficiencies at 30% and so forth for our power systems when we talk about burning the coal and all that stuff. But nature doesn't require you to do that. All you have to do is break a little bit of this three-symmetry set of chains where you have tied her feet to the floor. Once you break the flow in three dimensions, you no longer have to conserve energy in three dimensions. The basic conservation of energy is an inflow from four dimensions, outflow in, in three dimensions from the fourth dimension in converted and flowed out into three. And that one is free. Giant neg entropy is free. Nature will start reorganizing a goodly percentage of the whole vacuum for you, spreading it to speed of light, and will continue it as long as you leave the dipole alone. The original charges and dipoles and the original matter of the universe have been putting out energy and reorganizing the vacuum for 15 billion years. Today we're said we can't engineer Neg entropy, when neg entropy is the easiest thing in the world to engineer, whereas entropy is the hard way to do it, and that's the way we all do it. The bottom line of this is if we'll initiate the negative entropy and let it go, it's just like you punched a hole in the ground and you got a big gusher of oil. You don't have to furnish the pressure and you don't have to furnish the oil. Here it comes, and it comes out in real oil that you can use. 
And the common dipole in every electrical circuit pours out energy in that fashion. The problem is not how to get enormous energy from the vacuum. That problem then totally solved. It was actually solved in 1903 had we understood it, had we understood what Whitaker wrote. We didn't. But now we do understand it, and we do certify very rig rigorously with some of the AIS papers that that is for real. The problem now is how do we catch a goodly bit of this energy and use it asymmetrically, you dump it in a load, let it power that load, and not use half of it to go back over and kill the little dipole. So we set about then to build one that wasn't built that way. It, Yes, we have been successful. Uh, we have just built our second model. The first model produced five times out what we put in. Uh, we pay for switching code. We don't put any energy into it to actually power the system. It comes right out of a permanent magnet, the di which is a dipole. <clears throat> the reason for using a permanent magnet is very simple. You can pass the flux back in a flux channel back through the permanent magnet, and those poles don't get destroyed. They are welded into the material when you magnetize it. That's not like little charges separated in electrical charges. You knock the charges out and destroy the dipole. So we can bypass one of the big problems with a permanent magnet. We don't have to destroy the dipole. That gives us one solution going in. The other is, how do we catch the energy? Well, that turned out to be fairly simple. We found a material which will separate the magnetic field from what's called a magnetic vector potential. The pot vector potential flows unceasingly from the magnet. It'll flow from now for the next 15 billion years. You can't slow it down. You can't change it as long as that magnet is there. So you have plenty of energy flow. The question is how to use it. So we use it by diversion. We reason that this flow will replenish. It's like a river. It's like a humongous river. If we dip some energy out of it, it'll replenish the hole we dipped out of at the speed of light. So for all practical purposes, instantly. So we can dip and dip and dip. We have to pay the switch to do that. But we can keep dipping, and the water fills as fast as we dip it. Then if we come down to another area and we let the water that was replenished still interact with something, and at the same time we dump the water that we, we uh, dipped in there, we will have more energy by far than what we're paying for dipping. So we looked at it as an energy flow process, which it is. And we found a material which would do part of the dipping for us. It will separate the magnetic field from the magnetic vector potential. Yes, there is a history, a long history, of over-unity systems. What has happened to that? The, uh, for example, Nikola Tesla had one. Uh, basically, his big magnifying transformer that he had in, on Long Island was such an over-unity system. Uh, the way that one apparently worked is he got the entire Earth itself in resonance. The crust of the Earth, as you go down in there, is made of highly nonlinear materials, particularly when you get down to the perovskite or whatever you call that stuff. And it will act in, in the bulk, even. It will interact in a sort of a nonlinear optics fashion. It will do phase conjugation. And so eventually what it, what it does is everything going on is feeding energy into the Earth starts to feed energy into that wave that he created. So he gets a lot more energy in his resonant wave fed from outside, from the environment in the interior of the Earth. And that's the way he built up a, a humongous wave of energy. His idea was you could then put in a, a tap on it anywhere else on the world and extract it free. And, of course, J.P. Morgan's take on that was... That's foolish. You can't put a meter on it. So that uh, actually doomed much of Tesla's career at that point when Morgan found out that he, Tesla, was going to produce the energy freely. Small cost here at a central location. Everybody else could tap it for free. It wouldn't have powered the whole world today. It would have powered much of the world in those days. Tesla also, we're pretty sure, put uh, a system in a car and ran a car on it. And the reason we're uh, pretty sure is his nephew who rode in the car with him is still alive and can describe the incident and how the engine had no gas, no input of power, and would still run once Tesla got it started. And we know it's perfectly possible Tesla apparently knew how to use this giant neg entropy process that's universal everywhere. Energy is free for the taking from the vacuum anywhere you want it. We just have to learn to use that.
Some of the breakthroughs in the past have been deliberately suppressed. I will name a few. T. Henry Moray was inspired, of course, by Tesla's work, and he demonstrated so many times to so many scientific and engineering groups and people who were skilled in the art. There is absolutely no question that T. Henry Moray had uh, a system that produced 50, uh, about 50 kilowatts out of a 55-pound box. This is well established as you go back and look at all kind of certified uh, tests and everything else that he did. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of skullduggery that happened there. I don't think T. Henry Morey ever got a decent chance to ever do anything with that. The, uh, the Russians even tried to kidnap him at one time. It reads like a James Bond movie, but it's real. It really happened, and it really happened here in the United States. This was before the war. This was in the 1930s. In the same general period of time, one of the greatest electromagnetic fellows we ever had, scientists, was Gabriel Crone. And Gabriel Crone invented a true negative resistor uh, working on a Navy contract for Stanford University. He was never permitted to reveal the exact way that he constructed his negative resistor. But I used direct quotes where he, in fact, said we have a negative resistor and we can disconnect the generator from this network analyzer when we got negative resistors in there because they will power the circuit. So that one was, in fact, suppressed. I don't know whatever happened to it, but it, it vanished. And he never did reveal the secret of what he called his open path, connecting any two points in a circuit. But it is in the literature, and it's well documented because he was uh, one of, perhaps the leading electrical scientists in the United States at that time. Well, there's another one that went down the tube. Uh, various and sundry people have made casual ones from time to time over the years. I'd estimate probably 50 different inventors have made, casually invented something. Even if they didn't understand it, they did get it to go over unity. We're never able to get anything done with it uh, most of the time, they uh, incurred a lot of enmity from the scientific community. Um, sometimes we're really hounded, and sometimes we're just very naive. Probably the best documented scientifically uh, over unity system, self running, self powering systems, were developed by the Russians before World War II. It's in the French scientific literature, and it's also in the Russian scientific literature. The papers are there. I quote them in, in many of the things that I published. And you can go check the papers. The theory is there. Uh, many papers are published on this in the Russian scientific literature. They built what we call parametric oscillators. They have an oscillator going, and they change in the middle. They switch the actual inductance or capacitance or both of the thing so that it becomes a self-oscillation device. And they reached, uh, you know, goodly power for that, those days of 50 and 100 kilowatt devices. There are many ways of looking at uh, the suppression that's occurred in this area, and certainly I do not wish to talk about it myself, but I've been a victim of quite a bit of suppression. So has any other legitimate researcher in this area. All I can do is give you my ideas and... Uh, from, drawn from my own experiences and what I think it is and where I think it's coming from. Today, we don't have so much big kingdoms. Today, we have big economic uh, programs, big economic countries, or basically, we have cartels. We have a whole set of cartels in an area, interlocking corporations, and behind this, we have a few people who are quite wealthy and who own most things. Now, the normal nature of the beast for very powerful empires, let's call that an empire, it's a corporate empire, a set of corporations empire, it's basically a cartel. Historically, as far back as you want to go, we have had cartels. Any time we have a very powerful cartel or set of people that control a lot of things, that resists any means of changing its inflow of control and its inflow of funds and money and its power. You know, everybody's trying to be the big monkey. It's really as simple as that. And so the more powerful the agency, the more powerful the group, the more powerful the cartel, the more they will resort not only to legal means, but to extra legal means to suppress their competition. Uh, you know, this is an openly known today. For example, the greatest uh, espionage in the world is industrial espionage between one corporation and another right here in America. 
They're the ones that hire all the spies and their spooky equipment and everything like that, by far more than the intel agents do. So that's one thing we have. We have the giant industrial or really cartel, economic cartels in, in, in energy. And it's not one cartel. So there are many, many groups in energy. And each of those has become very powerful in its own area. And each one does not wish to see uh, simple little electrical taps pulling out enormous energy from the vacuum. They would much rather see uh, you burning a lot more oil and so forth. So yes, there's a, in my view, there is a very active uh, suppression effort by those kinds of folks. Part of that goes into very unique areas. They don't do it so, more, so much. It's not totally mafia type stuff. It's not like, you know, you just flat get shot. There's some of that. But one of the main re ways of suppressing it is they take a deep psychological profile of an individual that they wish to suppress. What, what it means is they really wish to get him entangled in all kinds of difficulties he can't get out of. Now, a good trait from a human being standpoint may be uh, a very valuable trait to somebody who wishes to manipulate you. For example, suppose you're easy to approach. That's a vulnerability. That's a serious vulnerability. So one's deep psychological profile is examined in great depth by real experts. And any way that you can be gotten to where you're naive, you don't have now, who knows international finance? You can be had on a, on a uh, money laundering scheme easily and not even recognize that's what you're in. Uh, so any way that you do not have good knowledge or you do not have ability or you have a vulnerability, they call them vulnerabilities, then they arrange scenarios just like you would write a movie. Uh, in fact, they do it with computers, all computerized. And in this scenario, we, have, we write a play where this particular vulnerability is going to be exploited in the target. Now, they keep deep psychological profiles on lots of useful fellows. Uh, these are people who basically have knee-jerk reactions or something, or they're radical, or they have some kind of way they interact which, if could be connected with you, would be in the area we wish the interaction to occur, to get you off into something else totally different from what you're doing. So the next thing you know here, all it takes to set that up may be a phone call and stimulate the interaction to occur. And then the controllers sit back and watch the game go. It's gaming. But it's just like right, watching a movie scenario. Uh, one of these days, we'll probably write a book on gaming and how it's done and... and uh, what kind of the main games they can use. But I can tell you they're very effective. Um, you can get so many different games from so many different walks of life by so many charming folks who are really oily characters that you would not believe it. And those come at you in mass. And usually they bury you. They bury you off in the courts. They bury you off. They get you tricked into doing an illegal act. How would they do that if you, if you wouldn't violate the law? Real simple. How can you be made to violate the law when you're not a criminal? Simple. Let me give you a for instance. A fellow comes in and he says, you know, we really need to get some real major financing. Every inventor's poor. Everybody's struggling. Nobody's got the money to build all these buildups, which may cost ten, fifteen thousand dollars, twenty thousand apiece. So everybody's struggling for money. So he comes in and we're going to raise this, we're going to form a stock company, we're going to do all these good things. Unbeknownst to you, he goes off to the Securities Exchange uh, Commission and several other people, Treasury Department, and he says, hey, I think I have fallen in with a den of thieves. Of course, he's the CEO now, understand? Of course, he's the guy who knows all this stuff. And I'll tell you what I'll do. If, uh, if you'll give me immunity to prosecution, I'll help you catch these crooks because they're going to do the greatest money laundering thing you ever heard of. It's going to come right out of one of these foreign countries. It's going to be scrubbed and come in here to fund this effort. It's going to be laundered dope money or something like that. You have no knowledge this is happening. And they give him. They jump at the chance. They'll give him the uh, immunity to prosecution. That's their normal modus operandi. They want to catch some crooks, and this guy's going to help them catch some crooks. So then he goes off and sets all this up and keeps you deluded about what's happening. And you wind up in a, where the thing is going to be consummated somewhere, and if you consummate it, you wind up behind bars for about 20 years wondering how you got there when you never did anything to money launder anything. 
he's the fellow who did it and who set it up, and he testifies against you because he's immune to prosecution. This is one of the standard games. Machiavelli is not dead. He still lives. And these are the games that are played, and it's particularly played in the, the systems where people are trying to build over-unity systems. It's been very effective in stopping some of them. Has, do you think lethal force has been used? Lethal force is used. I worked with an inventor, for example, the Sparky Suite is quite well known. And uh, he was shot at once with a silenced rifle from about, a sniper rifle from about 300 yards. The only thing that saved his life was uh, he was an old guy and very feeble there towards that part of his life. And he was stumbling as he coming up the steps, and he fell down. He just flat fell down on the steps, caught his foot, and fell right forward. And as his head went forward, the bullet went right by where his head was. And, of course, the assassin was never found. So there are many cases like that. Some are killed. I believe uh, Marinoff, I believe, to be a kill. I don't believe Marinoff jumped off a building when he was excited on the way to to uh, talk about his invention and so forth. Gave no indications of it. If I can believe the reports of the people who visited where his body lay, uh, where his body lay on the pavement glowed. And there's only one weapon in, on earth that will kill a human body and leave uh, where it lay, lies on the cement, let the cement glow under it. And that's a longitudinal wave shooter, what's called a shooter. So I believe, my personal belief, I can't prove this in a court of law, I don't intend to try. But my personal belief is that Marinoff was killed. He was probably killed by either the KGB or one of their agents from one of the other Iron Curtain, Curtain countries, killed with a shooter, thrown off the building to make it look like suicide. The police probably knew about it. That's why they let the body lay so long before they moved it. <laughs> they didn't want to tangle with the longitudinal waves from it. So, yes, there are some rather bizarre things that have occurred to some people. Uh, as I say... I prefer not to dwell on that, try to get by as much of that as we can and try to dwell on the science. The only way we're ever going to beat all of this stuff, we have to convince the scientific community that there's real science here. Let me now review some of the implications of what I hope is just now emerging in these, these energy systems where we take the energy from the vacuum, turn it into normal electromagnetic energy, and we catch it and use it to power our loads. First of all, every system we got out there has been doing this. We just didn't know it. We thought the generator powered the, the uh, external circuit. It doesn't. It does not power it at all. All it does is we twist the crank on the generator, the shaft, to turn the shaft, and that forms a magnetic field inside the generator, and that energy in that magnetic field dissipates itself upon the internal charges to force the positive charges in one direction and negative charges in the other to make that dipole, and that's all the generator does. It doesn't add one watt to the power line. All the coal, all the oil, all the dams ever built, all the nuclear fuel rods ever consumed, never added one single watt to the power line. All they did was keep rebuilding the dipole that we have designed a silly circuit to destroy faster than we can power the loads. Not the way to run the railroad. So we have polluted the planet. We have just, we're killing species. We're poisoning our own lungs and our own environment. Uh, we don't have to do that. But it's a giant set of cartels, it's a giant financial set of empires, and it's going to continue this way uh, unless we get the attention of the scientific community focused on it and hopefully get some legislative action focused to force the action to develop these kinds of systems. Now, the implications once we develop them and start to use them, first of all, we don't have to have all this nuclear Look how expensive and how long it takes to build a nuclear power plant. And then all the radioactive waste you have, you know, they still store the fuel rods on the sites after they're spent. They don't know what to do with them. So you've got all kinds of schemes about where you're going to put them. The blunt truth of it, right now we're storing them on site at the, at the nuclear power plants. Uh, the other thing is we don't need to pollute with all these hydrocarbon byproducts. We don't need to pollute the whole biosphere like that. We don't have to burn all that stuff just to make a dipole. Quit destroying a dipole. We don't have to remake it. So if we use the system where we extract it from the vacuum, we can clean up this biosphere. Uh, we can also, right now, one of the greatest critical things we have, in my view, the supply of oil is not lost, but the supply of cheap oil has now peaked. We are there. 
What this means is we will continue to get some oil, yes, but it will be more and more and more expensive year by year by year. Meanwhile, the demand for electricity goes up everywhere in the world, which drives the oil curve again, and what you have is a classic escalation of prices type of situation. The demand is up, the supply is down, the supply gets more and more expensive to try to fill it, and so the cost just going to go up and up, and they're not going to stop. Well, what happens? Somewhere along the line of about 2008, the way I look at it and project it, uh, we're going to have a world economic collapse. The economy cannot stand such increases as is going to come up. And God help us if we have a war in the Mideast. Nobody knows what. Maybe 2006, you know, instead of 2008. But I believe by 2008, we will see the world economy collapse. Now, about a year before that, as the economies are crumbling, not everything runs up in like a square wave collapses in one instant. As they start to crumble, and the stress on all these populations and all these leaders and all these nations are, increases so much, desperate people will do anything. Desperate leaders, particularly fanatical leaders, will do anything. What will happen is in their, their conflicts will increase and escalate, and they will start to use the weapons they have in those conflicts. And there's about 25 nations now, according to the Secretary of Defense coin, that have mass destruction weapons. Nuclear weapons, for example, for goodness sake. If you don't have nukes, maybe you bought some surreptitious plutonium. Look at what will happen to your water supply in New York City. You put a little plutonium in it. So... All kinds of things. People that are the poor nations that can't afford nukes have uh, biological weapons. But about 25, and it's growing all the time, has weapons of mass destruction. Now, by the way, those weapons are already in our large populations. If you will check Colonel Lunoff's book, uh, Colonel Lunoff is uh, the highest ranking GRU defector we ever had, and his book's cleared by the CIA, so what I'm saying is cleared. Lunoff tells you how the Russians introduced the uh, nuclear weapons surreptitiously into their operatives on the ground and secreted them in the U.S. He tells you how it was done in the book. So read the book. All our big cities, as far as I'm concerned, and population centers already have weapons of mass destruction hidden in them. We call, used to call that dead man fusing. And so all the nations have dead man fused one another one way or another, and all the old studies show that in a heightened tension, great conflicts and high tension, whenever they start popping the nuclear weapons or the weapons of mass destruction, you have a very formidable thing that happens to you. Nobody has defenses. Since we have no defenses, the only thing you have is like a, a fencing duel. You have to hit the enemy before he hits you. You have to destroy him or you will be destroyed. Mutual Assured Destruction is a funny acronym. The only thing that's debatable about it is whether the destruction shall be mutual or uni unitary. What happens is everybody fires on perception of preparation by his adversaries. And you have to fire everything you have as fast as you can, as rapidly as you can, as massively as you can to try to destroy your enemy. And you, otherwise, you have no chance of survival. So what we get is the great Armageddon everybody's been dreading. The energy crisis going right now, in my view, will probably evoke a great Armageddon that we've all feared so long in about 2007 if we don't solve the crisis. Because of the, what I view as the stress, of, I view this as the greatest strategic threat to survival of the United States and, in fact, of civilization itself that has ever existed in my lifetime. Now, the fools may blow the world from other causes. Don't misunderstand me. But they're going to blow it from this cause. This I'm quite certain of in my own view. So it means that anything I can do to try to stop that has to be done. What we need is a great Manhattan Project. You can do it. This is a doable. We have the principles. We know how to do the giant neg entropy. We have good scientists. We have some sharp young grad students and postdocs. They aren't allowed to work on these kinds of things. For goodness sakes, let's marshal them together like we did in World War II to get the atomic bomb, which we went from zilch, you might say, in four years. We had an operational bomb. Let's do the same thing here because survival depends on it, not only of us but of civilization. There's even a little evidence, and I don't know really how to, to put this in perspective. Uh, we had one friend, for example, that we worked with very closely who built practical over unity systems. He demonstrated at a conference, for, for example, an 8-kilowatt system. 
And then very mysteriously, he and his whole family disappeared. We have found out since, in fact, not long ago, that he's still around, but, and he's doing very well because he was attired in a very expensive suit and a very nice automobile. But he and his family are okay, even though they disappeared back there. But here was a successful unit that just flat disappeared off the face of the earth. Now, I assume, rightly or wrongly, it has to either be for the great financial empires or it has to be for some kind of black project that somebody needed a, a power system that would power itself in the load. And they classified it. Whatever it is, I don't know, but whatever it is, the survival of humanity itself and civilization itself is now at stake. And I really believe through the auspices of the U.S. government, regardless of what that kind of program in it, anywhere it may have, we must bring it forward to save ourselves and save the earth. If we don't, we can keep it secret or we can keep it in the control group hands and we shall all go down to oblivion in about 2007. What needs doing immediately deals with the scientific community. If you look at what the scientific community is doing, I'm speaking sadly, but I'm speaking bluntly and truthfully. If you will read the literature, you will find it's almost business as usual. They're not doing anything that has any chance of stopping this problem before the world explodes in our faces. Sure, windmills are good. Burning the oil cleaner is good. All of these things, building a couple of more dams is good if you don't destroy too much of the biosphere, etc., etc. Building some windmills is good. However, that's a spit in the ocean. It doesn't solve the problem. The problem is just exactly like what we had in World War II. We have a problem. It's a doable. It can be solved very quickly because we've got the first half of it already solved, how to get the energy out of the vacuum. So half of it is already done. But we can't get the scientific community to move on it to turn those young grad students loose and, and those young postdocs loose. The professor at the university, for goodness sakes, is trapped. He's absolutely trapped. All the universities are greedy. They want the overhead money. He's got to bring in extra money. He's got to get patents. And of course, he's got to get his papers published. So he's caught in a process where he must compete for the packages which are put together and come down for availability to compete for. If he doesn't get those packages and win them, he doesn't fund his grad students, he doesn't get the overhead money, he's going to be lucky if he's working for the grocery store instead of being a physicist. So he's in a mad scramble to try to feel and keep running on a treadmill to meet the conditions that's been laid down on him. And goodness sakes, those packages already prescribe all the research he's going to do and his grad students are going to do. So we've got the whole scientific community working on the wrong problem. What can the, what, so what could the U.S. government do about that? What we can do is do just like we did in alternative medicine, or really like the Manhattan Project. You can order the scientific community to do it, whether they wish to do it or not, and hold them accountable from the highest level to the bottom. How much money are we spending in our national laboratories on nuclear stuff? Don't we think at least about 10% of that money ought to be rooted out of there and spent on nothing but this, which might save us while the other stuff takes us down the tube? Of course we should. In fact, it ought to be more than that. The best scientists we have, the best grad students, the best postdocs ought to be turned loose on this problem, and that means funded. And that means that we do not allow scientists to slander and libel people who are trying to do research in this area. Right now, they do it wholesale, and they do it at will. Now, look at what they call me in print, for goodness sake. But the problem is the scientific community resists change, and it's doing business as usual. And my bottom line is, unless the legislative branch, together with the administration, forces them to get on this problem and solve it, they will not only fiddle while Rome burns, they will help burn it. Only alternative you have now, of course, since at this moment as we speak, the government has not moved. The scientific community has not moved. So that is a fact as of this moment I'm speaking. I hope that changes. I'm trying to change it. But right now that is a fact. And right now it's a fact they're not going to move unless something happens to move them and neither is the scientific community. 
But failing that, the only thing left is the private industry. And that's a mixed bag. First of all, the moment you try to do it in the private industry, then is when you are absolutely vulnerable to all the games. For example, lawsuit alone can hang you to where you will never come out of it for the next 15 years. The lawsuit doesn't have to be justified or anything at all. You can sue anybody for anything if you've got enough money to file the suit and want to swear. Simple as that. So the other thing you have is you can trigger anybody from anywhere for all kinds of radicals to come out of there and say, oh, you, st you used a coil of wire or you used uh, something over here, you used some semiconductor, you stole my invention. And so the next thing, you can be in court for 20 years on that. All of this comes at you. This is part of the delay. This is the group wanting to stay in power while we all go down the tubes. They operate primarily in the private sector. So you're automatically in that arena where the real lions are after you all the time. You're over there trying to find a legitimate deal. Okay, let's talk about venture capital, sometimes called vulture capital. But if you find a good one, it's not vulture, it's venture. What does a venture capitalist want to do? He wants to buy 30% or 50% of your company, or 51, or maybe 60. He's got the money. The next thing he wants to do is he's going to move you and all your guys right out of there, and he's going to put his own management team in there, and he's going to run it with bean counters. If you run this one with bean counters only, you destroy the program before you start. So your only choice, then, is to avoid venture capitalists like the plague, and to try to go for licensing, which means the brunt of doing the research on the front end falls on you and your meager resources, which for working people is whatever you can afford out of your back pocket. But if you don't do that, you're not going to do it anyway. How many have you seen in the past that went to venture capital route that were real? How many of them made it? I can name three or four that were real. They're not there yet. They're not going to be there. They were buried. So the thing that sets in, you have to do it by licensing. Then you've got to skirt, you've got to get the patent office. The patent office says it's impossible to do an over-unity system. The <laughs> API, the Physics Institute, you know, comes down on you and says uh, it's absolutely against the laws of nature. It isn't. You know, these are people who haven't even studied the problem, and they know classical thermodynamics. But it's against the laws of nature, and it violates classical uh, thermodynamics. Of course it violates classical thermo. You can't build one of these by classical thermal. You build it by the other kind of thermodynamics. So the next thing you have is scientific communities all over. Look what they did to cold fusion. There's real stuff in cold fusion. You know, 600 experiments worked, for goodness sake. So the thing is, you're against the scientific community, is against you, lock, stock, and barrel. And by the way, everything is a distribution curve. Get off of this horse pucky about scientists are always sweet, nice, reasonable people. That is not true. 10% of them are devils. 10% of them are angels. Ought to be rewarded at the salt of the earth. But 10% of them have absolutely no ethics, absolutely playing nothing but the big monkey and power game, and absolutely your worst enemy in this area. Glorious opportunity to, in other words, the vultures, or the, there's a better word for it, the wolves go around looking for the rabbits, and you're the rabbit and they're the wolf. So your next thing you get into is a big wolf-rabbit ga wolf game with the, the scientists over on that 10%. So you, you face all of that. Meanwhile, you've got to go to the patent office. You get to the patent office, what are you looking at? This is impossible. This is perpetual motion. You say, well, the atoms have been doing this for 15 billion years. It's not perpetual motion, but it's just long-lasting. But they call it perpetual motion, and of course there is an unwritten law that anything that's perpetual motion shall not be even proved or looked at. You can't even get a serious consideration in the patent office. I speak as one who has submitted patents in this area. I know what I'm talking about. I've defended a couple of them. So what we have is a situation where the entire structure of science, industry, uh, the organizations of science, and the patent office are already against you. If you can't get a patent, how can you license? So it's a real neat little thing. It's the old chicken and egg situation. If I had the chickens, I could get some eggs. If I had the eggs, I could get some chickens. This situation is designed so you never get chickens and you never get eggs. 
So the only thing you can do is, is to try to put your head down and continue with that and do one other thing, communication. Fortunately, we do have the Internet. Of course, sure, it's full of a lot of bad information. It's also full of a lot of good information. You just have to discriminate. So the other thing you have to do to have any chance at all is communicate, 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 which we do to the limit that we're legally able to do and not lose our patents. If we can get the government to move, they can cut through all of that by simply issuing the order to do it. And that's what it's going to take. We're going to struggle with this other, but I'll make you a prediction. If the government doesn't move, there's a 75 to 80 percent chance we will fail. We certainly won't make the first quarter of 2004. And if we miss the first quarter of 2004, not just us, there are several other inventors and, and groups in the same area and have, have systems that work. We are not the Lone Ranger here at all. I want every system out there that works and is real go going. We need everything we can do. But if we don't make it by the first quarter, then we may as well all go home and enjoy our families for the time we have left because it's going to blow. It will be too little and too late. And don't come in in 2006 when any fool can then see the world is fixing to blow up and say, would you guys like to try this? I'll say, no, I'm going to enjoy my family while the time I have left. You blew it back in 2000 and 2001. You decided right then to blow it. And so it's on your head. And that's will be all we can do if we don't make the schedule. Everybody wants a modern life. They want to get out of the mud and the slime and everything and have lights and have, you know, things that are powered and have industry and jobs and homes and schools. It's a common uh, striving from the human heart. And to try to do that the way we're doing it will destroy the planet and we will, we will forcefully destroy each other. It seems to me we just ought to be wiser than that.